Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Fabian Drixler, Assistant Professor of History at Yale University. Professor Drixler teaches Japanese history. Today we talk with him about his forthcoming book, Infanticide and Fertility in Japan, 1650 to 1950. Welcome, Professor Drixler. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Let's begin um, talking about your book. Uh, tell us a little bit about it. So the book um, is a cultural history of infanticide and a demographic history of fertility change wrapped into one. Um, one way to think about it is that there, there is this uh, great turning point uh, that, I, that I identify in the years around 1800. So in 1750, you have a world where in, in large parts of Japan, um, people will only try to raise two or three children, and some of those children will die, so at the end of the day, um, they'll have less than uh, two descendants per couple. Uh, the way they achieve that is through widespread uh, infanticide, mostly. Um, by 1850, infanticide has been questioned, has been combated, uh, has been widely discussed. And people once again now um, raise four or five children per couple. By 1920, they raise six kids, and infanticide is rapidly becoming something that, that is more or less uh, unthinkable. So that's, that's uh, the, the great arc that I'm uh, trying to mm -hmm. describe with this book. And it is such a, it's an interesting topic, and I would imagine somewhat of a difficult one, infanticide. Um, and you've looked at many different aspects of Japan. <laughs> Why infanticide, for instance? Why write this book? Um, infanticide uh, is, a, is a great window into uh, people's minds, because the whole practice of it, which uh, has become so unthinkable in our society, depends on the way that people uh, imagine themselves uh, in, in their universe and uh, in, in the way they, they understand um, when human life begins, uh, what happens after death, both for uh, the infants you kill and, and perhaps your ancestors uh, who linger around the family as, as protective spirits. Um, it relates uh, in more complicated ways to, to the way you, you imagine the nature of time, uh, the way you define community. So in that sense, it's a very attractive topic. Um, the other reason, though, why I think it's, it's so important is that uh, demography is a great way to, to understand uh, the past in many ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, really, a colonization frontier of knowledge, there's shockingly little in, in many ways. We know about the demographic past uh, of, of our world, and there's been um, a huge amount of wonderful work over the past uh, two or three generations. But the things we don't know are uh, just astonishing once you, once you contemplate them. Okay, and let's talk about your methodology. Mm -hmm. How did you do your research? So the research really has, has two major legs. Mm -hmm. um, the first leg is uh, the, the demographic analysis of um, a large collection of individual level data. So uh, I spent uh, many years going through libraries and archives uh, tracking down population registers from the 17th, 18th, and 19th century. And but are they readily mm -hmm. accessible? Some of them are. One wonderful thing about Japan is that um, each municipality uh, has, at some point uh, in the last 50 or, or 60 years, uh, launched a local history project um, whereby they, they wrote up the history of their town. And even for small villages, th these, these collections can run to 10 magnif magnificent cloth-bound uh, volumes. And in many of those, they, they collect uh, the, the documents that are available locally. Uh, type them up for you, publish them, and deliver them to the shelves of the Sterling Memorial Library. Um, and this is especially important because uh, the archival system of Japan, for the early modern period anyway, is not especially well developed. And so only a small fraction, maybe five, maybe 10 percent, of the surviving village-level documents from this period can actually be accessed in archives. All the rest is still owned um, by the descendants of the headmen, uh, for instance, who created these documents in the first place. Uh, and so the only efficient way of accessing them without going through a long uh, dance of, of uh, gaining the trust of these individuals um, is to, to, to find them in these collections. That said, the archival collections have been really useful for my project as well. So uh, there's something like a third of these population registers are things that I've, that I've uh, found in archives. So that's the first leg. Mm -hmm. um, the second leg uh, is a 
wonderful uh, wealth of different um, types of materials on infanticide. I say wonderful because, well, it's a strange word to use maybe in this context, but um, as I got deeper and deeper into this project, I, I was just astonished how many different kinds uh, of materials you can find about infanticide. So there are policy proposals that um, villagers might send to uh, their lord with uh, ideas of how to combat infanticide. Mm -hmm. um, there are uh, pregnancy reports that peasant women had to submit to the authorities to uh, to respond to, 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 to a surveillance policy that tried to stamp out infanticide. But there are more unexpected things too, like poems um, about a uh, stealer for uh, murdered silkworms mm -hmm. in, in regions where people kill infants without a second thought, according to the author of the poem, or the dialogue between a louse and the giant bird Pung of the East Asian bestiary whose wingspan is uh, a thousand leagues. Mm -hmm. um, they talk about infanticide. They talk about nothing but uh, infanticide. And then finally, there, there is a, a rich visual record as well. Um, and to track down that record uh, has, has perhaps been the most uh, adventurous, exciting part of, of the research process. Uh, because a, a lot of these materials are rather large wooden boards that mm -hmm. are painted with an infanticide scene. Uh, and the murderous mother then transforms into a she-devil uh, or an animal. So the message being, you commit infanticide, you lose your humanity. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of these have been lost because they weren't considered uh, great works of art. But uh, several dozen remain. And often they are tucked away in some chapel uh, deep in the mountains that might only open on, on two predetermined days in the year for, for airing out, as they call it. Mm -hmm. And then the community gathers uh, in, in, in the chapel and, and has a little party. And, and so were you able to um, visit on those days and have access to that information? Or? Right, with the, with the help of many people, I, I mm -hmm. was. And you know, also get a sense of how uh, the descendants of people in these areas who, who are now in charge of those chapels think about those artifacts and think about the history uh, of infanticide. And one of the most wonderful things was that I, that I found this one um, local employee of uh, a prefectural museum. And I went there because I knew that they, in their, in their storage, had, had one infanticide tablet. And he said, oh, why don't you come back in uh, three or four days? I'll get the museum car, and then I'll drive you to all the places you want to be driven in my prefecture. And so he, you know, I gave him the list of, of uh, sites I wanted to visit. He made all the phone calls, he got the car, and I had this, these delightful four days mm -hmm. with, with this very generous man, uh, tracking down uh, these images that in many cases you can't uh, find anywhere in the published mm -hmm. uh, record. Now, in, in sitting here listening to you, the thought strikes me, uh, particularly when you look at the um, you know, written r registries, mm -hmm. were the deaths tracked or was it just births? So in other words, uh, did they just you know, pretend that the death never happened? And mm -hmm. it, uh, how, how does that work? Well, that's a very astute question. Um, there's not a whole lot of uh, direct evidence Mm -hmm. uh, for infanticide. So we have one diary of a man who, who mentions that he kills his own children in, in three cases and a couple of other uh, documents where people admit that they themselves are practicing infanticide. But on the whole we have the complaints of people who think that infanticide is a problem mm -hmm. or the sort of rather feeble uh, excuses of people who think that it's not a problem. And then we have the patterns of the demographic record. And to, to respond more directly to your question, um, the population registers of the Tokugawa period, the, the sort of heart of the 300 years that I span in my project, um, only recorded children typically the first time um, the annual recording ritual coincided with their lives. So if a child was born in December, um, the first recording might be uh, in, in March when the population register was compiled. If the child was born uh, in April, it would also be in March of the next year. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we can't actually literally track births with a couple of exceptions. And we don't see these early, um, these early childhood deaths. So part of my methodology was to uh, back project the, pop the, 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 the population. Um, and there's been a lot of good work uh, that, that allows us to estimate the sort of, uh, unintended infant mortality rates with mm -hmm. a lot of, of confidence. Um, they're right around uh, 15, 20%. And so if you find 10 children mm -hmm. in, the, in the record, uh, 
uh, this means that you, you, you should assume that originally there were 12 or 13 children, I mean, put, put very crudely. Um, and so really the, the victims of infanticide are these absences that we have to track down in the record. And um, they're visible in all sorts of patterns, patterns that depend on uh, the gender of the child, uh, for, for, for example, but also the timing of the birth. And then just in the implausibly low number mm -hmm. of, of children that, that people say they've given birth to. And we're, we're talking two or three children when um, under the kind of conditions of life and contraceptive technology and so on that people had at the time, uh, it's hard to imagine that people would have had fewer than uh, six or seven children without um, the practice of infanticide. You speak of three different cultures of mm -hmm. infanticide in Japan. Let's talk a little bit about that. So I think one, one uh, good way to visualize those different cultures is to look at two encounters that uh, happened in um, highway inns in Japan in the early 18th century. One of them was between, um, one, one of them involved a pilgrim from uh, a part of southern Shikoku uh, who was going to the great shrine of Itsukushima, which I noticed um, is part of the clip that you play at the beginning of oh, these interviews. It's okay. this little, little postcard yes. picture of a shrine gate mm -hmm. um, in, in, in the water. I guess the, the one image that represents Japan most directly in, uh, in, in this clip. He stays at an inn. All of a sudden, um, another, another guest uh, rushes out. There's a big commotion. And he turns to another a lodger at the inn and asks, what's going on? Um, has somebody discovered that there are robbers among the travelers? And he says, no, actually we discovered that there is a man from southern Shikoku uh, among us. And in southern Shikoku, people uh, will kill children without a second thought. And we are on this holy pilgrimage. We can't share a roof with people um, who do such a thing. Mm -hmm. And so the, the man from southern Shikoku is so uh, ashamed that he uh, breaks off his pilgrimage and goes home and, and vows to do better. So that's, uh, oh, and I, I, I should note, uh, in the conversation that unfolds about infanticide in this inn, um, the pilgrims say, well, we are from a part of Japan where such a thing could never happen. Now, when a woman is pregnant uh, from uh, an adulterous affair, she might uh, seek the assistance of an abortionist. But the abortionists are so frowned upon by the population that, that even little children know that uh, you can't even point at their houses because uh, your fingers will rot off oh if you God. do, and, and we only suffer them to live at the edges of the village and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's encounter number one. Encounter number two uh, happens uh, at the other end of Japan in the east, right around the same time, so okay, 1720. Um, and you have a medicine peddler from um, a, a region of Japan that again is proud uh, to raise every single child. Mm -hmm. um, and he stays at this inn in a part of Japan uh, that is sort of a byword for infanticide by this time, the, the Northeast. And he sees that the innkeeper is uh, carrying out um, the, the, the child, a, a newborn child into the garden. And he thinks this odd and, and tags along. Um, and uh, when he notices that an infanticide is going to happen, uh, he clings to his sleeves and eventually talks him into accepting um, a, a subsidy for buying milk um, in, in exchange for, for raising the child. Now, both of these are stories that are written down um, much later, and, and so there are no doubt lots of embellishments. But uh, they were plausible to people. And the reason they were plausible is that you had, broadly speaking, uh, three different cultures of infanticide. One is, is the culture that I dedicate most of my book to, mm -hmm. um, a culture that, that uses infanticide uh, as the major form of family planning um, and uses it to an extent that uh, results in depopulation, uh, every generation being smaller than the one that preceded it. There is a second area where infanticide is still evident in the traces of the uh, demographic record, but people don't talk much about it at the time, and it's not frequent enough to uh, be the cause of major depopulation in those areas. And then there's the, 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 the final third of the archipelago where uh, people make it part of their identity that they do not commit infanticide. Although if you start looking into uh, their population registers, there are lots of funny things going on there too. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's pretty clear that infanticide was to some extent practiced there. But more importantly, they resorted to different ways of keeping their household size manageable. And um, 
a lot of those ways abhorred people who uh, lived in the infanticidal areas. Um, so, for example, uh, they, they involved uh, selling six, seven-year-old daughters into prostitution. And so the people in the infanticidal lands would say, um, you people are just like dogs and cats. How can you just sell your, your children as though they were animals? Mm -hmm. um, we are the true humans. We raise our children well. And sure enough, we have to discard uh, some of our kids mm -hmm. to do so. But um, it's more important to raise the chosen children well uh, than to afflict um, all children that will come with a life of, of poverty and, and hunger and cold mm -hmm. and, and bondage in many right. cases. Okay, so uh, is it primarily a geographic difference um, where these beliefs were different? S uh, would, would that be true? And then I guess it strikes me as, uh, in terms of what you just said, the chosen child, how were these children chosen? Uh, and then th the other awful thing is, who would be the one to kill the child? Ah, uh, lots of great questions. Yeah. Um, let's see how I can do this without launching into a long, okay. long, long monologue. Um, the geographical divisions were clearly present in people's minds in the 18th century. You know, 18th century is kind of the heyday of this culture of infanticide. On the ground, things were more complicated. And of course, there were disagreements. Uh, some people living in areas um, where infanticide uh, was very common didn't think it was a good idea. But village communities were fairly tight-knit. Mm -hmm. And if there was a poor family that raised a fourth or a fifth child, the neighbors would come, knock come knocking at the door and ask, what are you doing? Um, what kind of unreasonable behavior is this? Mm -hmm. You'll drive your household into ruin. Um, you're not doing right by your own children. And by the way, you'll be a welfare case for the rest of the village. So why don't you rethink this, mm -hmm. this pregnancy? And that's a major factor for, for creating this, this sure. geographical uh, unity. The other thing is that people's attitudes to uh, a lot of important issues, including life, death, um, is infanticide acceptable, really depend on whom they interact with. Sure. Uh, and especially in uh, an 18th century society, uh, interactions are very much spatially bound. So the number of people you know who think that infanticide is a good idea will depend very much on where you live. And so that's, that's a real factor for, for this geographic pattern that we see. Um, on the other hand, there are these disagreements, and they really open up in the 19th century, when especially uh, local elites and uh, so the, the, the warrior governments uh, that, that uh, ultimately administer the villages begin to think that infanticide is a huge political or social economic problem. Um, and you know, then it's a question, how do these sort of pioneers of the new view of uh, infant life being sacred uh, convey that mm -hmm. to uh, the, in their view, benighted parts of the population? You also asked how people selected. Right. Um, well, does it matter if it was a boy or a girl? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, uh, uh, did it maybe the number mattered? You know, they went even odd, even odd. I, you know, mm -hmm. I have no idea. Um, and then. Who was the one to take care of that um, terrible task, and how? So infanticide is, is quite common um, in the ethnographic and historical record, once you care to look. And uh, a lot of people know that in, in places like uh, China or India, it, it really tended to target women, or mm -hmm. that's at least the impression you get from reading the documents, the, the contemporary accounts. In Japan, it was more complicated. If you were a girl, you were at a slightly higher risk of falling victim um, to your parents' unwillingness to raise you. But uh, one very typical pattern that we see very, very strongly in the demographic record is that your chances of being accepted by your parents depend on how many children of the same gender already exist in the household. So if you're a girl and you're born into a family with two sons, um, chances are that your parents like the idea of having this kind of balance. Sure. If you're a girl born into a family uh, with two daughters, they probably don't need a third daughter, mm -hmm. and that, that will be it for you. Wow. Uh, similarly, if you're a son, um, and you know, you're the third or the fourth son, and there's no daughter in the household, the parents might think, oh, we'd actually quite like our third child to be a daughter, so mm -hmm. let's um, send this child back, as the, right. as the phrase went, and you know, not another one will come in a, in a right. year or two or three. And who took care of sending the child back? Typically. 
that's actually uh, a surprisingly difficult question. So we have all these um, accounts mm -hmm. and, and images. And almost invariably, it's women who do uh, the killing. Wow, but that is shocking to me. I would have said it was the father or a third party. Now, it's interesting to, to think about why it is, it is shocking to us. And I think um, part of that is that we live in a world where maternal love and, and immediate maternal love uh, is, is taken for granted. Mm -hmm. um, but one thing that you know, this world that I've spent a lot of time thinking about suggests is that maybe uh, this is not uh, as, as, as natural as, as we might think and uh, much more culturally bound. Mm -hmm. um, and again, if you, if you look around the world, infanticide is so commonly uh, practiced in, in many societies. Well, not anymore, but mm -hmm. And actually, I was um, going I'm, uh, mm -hmm. down the road. I will get to asking you at what point did it become completely unacceptable? Well, maybe I should uh, launch right into that. Yes, we'll, we'll finish up with the, the, oh. the questions of uh, who, 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 was, who right, was responsible. Who was responsible and so one thing that made it more likely that women would do the killing, or I should say, one thing that makes it more plausible that it re really was women, is that um, men did not lightly enter the, the birthing space. Mm -hmm. um, childbirth uh, was, was considered uh, something that uh, was polluting, you know, with all the blood being spilled. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, quite often it would happen even in poor families in, in a part of the, the house that would be screened off, mm -hmm. sort of a, a, a separate space. And, and again, men wouldn't usually enter that. And even in the early 20th century, a large proportion of, proportion of Japanese women give birth unaided. They just uh, squat down by themselves and deliver the child by themselves. Wow. Maybe their mother-in-law will be around, maybe a friend, but often not even that. I think that's also really difficult Mm -hmm. to imagine, uh, right, from, from, from our current society. Um, so there, there is a certain ferocious strength to, to, to these women that, that is in some ways, I think, alien uh, to what we assume to, to, be, to, sure. be, to be natural. Um, but of course, when you, when you start analyzing these accounts, there's, there's this uh, intriguing gender um, dimension to it. You know, men um, trying to change the behavior of women or, or denigrating women, uh, painting women as being uh, transmogrified into demons, into, into animals. Uh, and so to some extent, these accounts of women uh, doing the killing might be, might be slightly uh, problematic, and I don't, I don't have an ultimate answer to that. In terms of who made the decision, it seems that usually it was uh, consensual within, within the family. Uh, in, in, in some cases, uh, th there would have been conflicts about it, and you know we have accounts of uh, well, one of the rare cases where a husband kills the child and, and the wife said, no, this was a misunderstanding. I actually wanted to raise the child and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, vice versa. Um, but, but typically, um, you know, the, the grandparents would have a role and, and, and both parents. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in going through the material that you sent to me, it looks like literally millions of babies were killed during this mm -hmm. 300 year span, I imagine more in the earlier period mm -hmm. than moving toward the 1950s. Um, and from what you've said today, it's primarily um, a survival mechanism or, or economic where either the village or the family would suffer if these children were not killed. Um, so that gets me to the mm -hmm. point where at what point um, did it become unacceptable and, and, and why did that happen? I should say first that, that suffering is very relative. Mm -hmm. And um, I know infanticide has been studied for a long time by historians uh, for something like 90 years. And for the first couple of decades, um, the sort of standard view was that infanticide was uh, proof that life was really very bad uh, mm -hmm. for the people of the 18th century and that they were always at the brink of starvation and, and so on and so forth. And there's a little bit of truth to that. But if you look at um, who uh, in a sort of social stratification sense practiced infanticide, there are periods when the rich seem to do it a little bit more than the poor, and generally it's, it's very even. Um, so you know, if you're a rich person, uh, suffering means that uh, you can't throw a big party for um, 
the seventh birthday of your child, uh, mm -hmm. that, 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 that sort of thing, right? You, you, you can't send presents to everybody in the village as you're supposed to. I see. Uh, you can't uh, buy a nice uh, new uh, dress for your daughter. Um, you can't send your, your son to school if, you're, if you have seven of them. Um, but even for the poor, it wasn't usually a question of death or survival. There was this idea of what um, an appropriate way of raising a child would be. And that appropriate way of raising a child depended on your economic station. Mm -hmm. um, and so the fertility norm worked out in a way that uh, everybody was supposed to, to raise two or three children um, and raise them as well as they possibly could. Mm -hmm. uh, you can look beyond the economics of why people um, committed infanticide. And uh, there were various ideas that made infanticide seem virtuous. Again, a very bizarre notion to us. Mm -hmm. um, one of those was that, uh, well, I've, I've mentioned several times already, you have to do right by the children you choose to raise. Um, so to be a good parent, you commit infanticide, paradoxically. Another paradox is that people who cared a lot about their posterity, about their descendants, were encouraged to commit infanticide. What mattered was the survival of the household, not the question how many descendants you have, but that this is one prosperous household mm -hmm. that uh, keeps perpetuating itself in, 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 in time and sticks around to venerate its ancestors. And the best way to ensure the prosperity of the household is to make sure the property doesn't have to be divided between sure. six sons, right? Um, right? Or, or even the, the expenses of raising the children detract from the strength of the household in the future. Um, and so this, this idea of how the afterlife works uh, becomes entangled in the practice of infanticide. And it means that practicing infanticide is a boon for your descendants, but also for your ancestors who can then enjoy the continued veneration of the household and remain in their sort of pleasant, serene state of, of ancestral deities. Because mm -hmm. once the household vanish vanishes, those ancestors have to go back to the cycle of rebirth and suffering that uh, is, is a big part of the Buddhist okay. worldview. Um, so it, 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 is, it is really, and one reason this, this book is, is getting very long um, is that this is a very uh, complex culture that has its own logic that, that I, I find takes a while to, to wrap one's mind around. Maybe one important piece of the puzzle, though, that I, that I haven't mentioned yet is why there aren't big barriers to committing infanticide. Right? It's, it's one thing to have a reason to want fewer children. That was true for people in uh, many places and times. Um, but it's another thing to actually take the step and kill the child. And, and so a real key uh, issue is whether you think um, that under any circumstances a child can be killed. And the reason uh, people who otherwise thought of themselves as, as, as good and kind uh, in the 18th century, say, would commit infanticide was that um, a child, a newborn child, was not considered a fully formed human being. And one way we can understand that maybe is to think about people who, are, well, at least in the liberal parts, well, let's say the, the pro-choice parts of America, uh, have abortions. Mm -hmm. They don't think of themselves as worse parents. Um, the reason they can have abortions um, is that they don't think of a fetus in the first trimester as a, as a fully formed right. human being. Sure. Um, and where we draw that line between something that isn't quite a human being yet and uh, a member of human society who deserves the full protections um, that that membership affords mm -hmm. is arbitrary. Mm -hmm. um, you can say it's convenient to, to draw it at birth because that's an impressive event with lots of noise and, mm -hmm. and, and blood and so on. Um, but a lot of societies actually drew it a couple of minutes after birth at the point when parents made the decision whether they wanted to keep the child mm -hmm. or to discard the child. And this is very much the story um, of this uh, culture of infanticide in Japan that I study. Um, getting back mm -hmm. to uh, the, the, uh, one of the questions I had asked previously. So you had said the mother um, will pretty much kill the child after giving birth. Mm -hmm. Is there a special ritual that one would do um, as part of this? or? Uh, ah, that's a really interesting question. Um, if anything, the absence of ritual in some ways is striking. So the, it's the ritual that turns the child into a member of the household, mm -hmm. into a member of the human uh, community. And that ritual would, would be a bath. Mm 
mm -hmm. uh, typically, or being wrapped in a in a in a rag mm -hmm. uh, kind of thing. Um, there were different ways of committing infanticide, uh, and you know some of them involve things that seem strangely elaborate, like uh, taking a soaked piece of paper and putting it on the face mm -hmm. of the child to, s to suffocate the right. child. So maybe you can think of that as a ritual and say, well, why, d why do they go to the trouble of soaking a piece of paper? Maybe it's the idea that the child shouldn't even draw a breath mm -hmm. um, to ensure that the child hasn't crossed this, this threshold to full human life. I should also note that um, this attitude to children occurs in a society that on the whole is, is really worried about killing um, other beings. It's a society that uh, puts up stone monuments to silkworms that are killed in sericulture, mm -hmm. monuments to uh, grasshoppers that uh, have to be killed by pesticides uh, so that they don't um, devastate the crop. Uh, it's a society that, that has elaborate burial rituals for whales that are beached or, or hunted down. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the real story seems to be that um, children are liminal, uh, at the point of birth anyway, um, and they can return to, to kind of a, uh, an ill-defined spirit world without a great deal of pain, um, and in a way that isn't really a death. Mm -hmm. And because it's not really a death, uh, killing the child isn't really taking a life. Um, and people come up with euphemisms that, uh, like sending back the child or, or weeding out, um, weeding out uh, superfluous plants that um, make it, I think, psychologically easier for them mm -hmm. to, to commit infanticide because there's no doubt that it's still unpleasant for people. Sure. Right? Nobody, nobody likes mm -hmm. uh, doing this, but um, you need a lot of, uh, sort of cultural justifications for committing infanticide mm -hmm. and, and a lot of incentives for doing it as well. Okay, and your book goes to 1950. Mm -hmm. Were there still infanticides um, taking place at that time? And, and uh, did you study the period you know, after that? When did it officially end mm -hmm. or was outlawed or is it outlawed at this point? I, I assume it is. Oh yes, very much so. Yes. <laughs> um, so the, the situation of infanticide in Japan today is, is the same as in uh, the United States, okay. really. It, it happens rarely. When it happens, people are shocked. Mm -hmm. um, about, uh, let's see, 30 or 40 years ago, there was a series of babies abandoned in coin lockers, and people found that very shocking and, and thought it said something profound and disturbing about the state of their society, which in itself is interesting because you know, some of the people who lived in, in a world where infanticide was something to be encouraged were, were still alive at, at this time. So it gives you a sense of the magnitude of the social change. Um, the single most surprising discovery for me in, in this project actually was that infanticide still occurred on a, on a huge scale in the early 20th century. When I submitted my dissertation, the first version of this project, um, I thought I had it all figured out, and, and the arc was that by the 1880s, uh, which is the time when people stopped talking about infanticide, mm -hmm. it also went, um, went away as a, as a phenomenon. Um, there's, there's a break in the demographic record mm -hmm. uh, right after 1870, and so we can't perform the kind of analyses uh, that the, the early material allows in the modern period, uh, which, which is rather ironic. But the modern period has um, another type of, of data that in some ways is, is just as valuable. And those are statistics about stillbirths. Mm -hmm. um, and stillbirths are fairly consistent uh, in, 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 in different societies when you, uh, you know, look at all the statistics that have been collected in 19th century Europe and uh, 20th century developing world and, and so on. And it's very rare for a stillbirth rate to go um, over 4%. Mm -hmm. In Japan, there are districts where it was more than 40%, okay. meaning they were calling, yes, they were calling the, uh, they were just using a different word for the infanticide being stillbirth. Exactly, right, yes. to, because they had to report it to the authorities. And sure. um, in an individual case, it's very hard to tell, right? And you, you only notice that there's a huge um, sort of cover-up going on mm -hmm. when you uh, look at the statistics and, and look at them in space. Because when you add it up for all of Japan, the, the rate is only 7%, and so you say, ah, oh, well, maybe... Um, 
health conditions like syphilis drove it up. But when you see that there are these uh, sort of clusters where almost uh, every second child is claimed to be stillborn, you, you notice that something um, funny is, is, is going on. Now, this is still very much um, the situation around 1900. Mm -hmm. But then uh, in the 1920s, the, the stillbirth rates begin to fall uh, rapidly. And, and so our estimates for um, the number of infanticides really go down from, depending on where you see the balance between late-term abortions and infanticides, tens of thousands or, or more than 100,000 the, at the beginning of the 20th century to just a couple of thousand uh, in the late 30s. And then because of the um, the Great East Asia and then Pacific War, there's, a, there's another break in the statistics. And um, we don't really know what's going on during the war based on be because the statistics just, just mm -hmm. aren't there. Um, after the war, I found sort of one, one report of a woman remembering her life um, that, that mentions an infanticide in 1945. Uh, but this, this would have been you know, a fairly exceptional mm -hmm. occurrence, is my sense. And then um, in, in 1948, f 1949, abortion is uh, effectively legalized in Japan. I see. And you get this huge surge in abortion. Um, there are somewhere between uh, a million and three million abortions, depending on how many you think were really reported mm -hmm. uh, by, by the mid-1950s. And abortion, for this brief moment in time, becomes the main way that Japanese couples uh, plan their, their families and then uh, contraceptive practice slowly, gradually uh, take, takes over. But once safe abortion is, is available, um, there's just no more need to, to right commit infanticide. Right. And also the fact that the rates already declined so much in the 1920s suggests that there's something very incongruous about living in a world of electricity and uh, you know, being, being a citizen of a civilizing empire that has so much civilization that it can share it with uh, the less fortunate parts of Asia, whether they want it or not, mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, and committing infanticide on, on the other hand. So there might also be a generational story uh, that you know, in the 1920s, the women who are in their 40s and have their, their, their last children, they might still think infanticide is uh, culturally acceptable, but their daughters who have um, usually had a primary school education at least, and to a much more part of this, this new world, uh, do not see it this way. There are a lot of open questions for me, uh, mm -hmm. especially in this 20th century part. I hope somebody else will, will pick it up in the years ahead and, and uh, look more, more deeply into this. But at present, that's, that's my best guess of, of the dynamics that mm -hmm. lead to, to the terminal retreat of, of infanticide from Japan. Okay, very good. Thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Oh, I enjoyed it, as you can tell. Thank you very much. For more information about Professor Drixler and his research, please visit our website at yale.edu backslash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale. Mm -hmm.